Welcome to our international leadership series on the impact of COVID-19 on the wealth management industry. How will the industry evolve as a result of COVID-19 and how technology will play a role? We have a very special guest and honor who will speak with us today, Mr. Victor Materanz. A little bit about his fantastic background. Victor is a senior executive vice president, head of group strategy and VP of the executive chairman's office at Banco Santander. He's in charge of articulating the group's overall strategy, working together with the leadership team of the main 10 markets in which Santander operates in Europe and in the Americas. He's in, also in charge of the strategic and inorganic projects, and he's a member of the board of Santander's US. Prior to that, he was the director of strategy and chief of staff to the CEO of Santander UK, where he spent more than two years shaping the strategy of the bank and leading the innovation group. Before joining Santander in early 2012, Victor was a partner at McKinsey and Company, working in retail, retail banking across the globe, leading to the retail distribution and multi-channel initiatives in Europe. On the moderator side, we have one and only Nazir Subari, CEO of The Loft. Nazir has worked in financial services for 20 years. He spent 13 years working with, uh, within capital markets and has been immersed in the fintech and startup sector for the past eight years. As an entrepreneur, Nazir has built multiple fintech businesses across the verticals. He has advised the boards of leading financial institutions, central banks, and governments. Nazir is included in the top 40 innovators shaping the future of financial services by the Wall Street Journal. Nazir sits on the IMF's high-level advisory group on finance and technology and is a member of the Blockchain Expert Policy Advisory Board at the USAID. Gentlemen, Mr. Mazarans, Nazir, the screens are yours. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you for the introduction and welcome to everyone listening in and welcome to Victor. Victor, I hope everything is well in Madrid and the weather is and the sun is shining. Um, Luxembourg is not too bad at the moment, but I do envy you somewhat. <laughs> um, the weather is very nice. That thing, uh, we can't complain at all and uh, it hasn't deteriorated over the past year as many other things. <laughs> so um, we, we, we can stick to weather, yes. Indeed. Um, so, Victor, I mean, you've been now back in Spain uh, six years. We, I just heard from you. Um, you moved back over to Madrid with, with Anna when she took over uh, running the, the whole group. Um, and in this particular role, although I heard that you, you, you've got many moment, including continuing with the broad strategy for Santander. But we're here to talk mainly about a, a sector that is very dear to Luxembourg's heart, which is wealth management and insurance, um, and to get your international perspective on this. So, I mean, I guess a broad starting point would be, well, a little bit of context. I mean, we're seeing in Luxembourg uh, more and more consolidation and a little bit of, um, uh, you know, lowering of volumes in the whole private banking space. I'd love to get your thoughts from Santander's perspective, your personal thoughts, as to the direction of wealth management generally and um, where it's going, how you feel it will evolve and what are some of the main challenges you're facing. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Nasir, and, um, and thank you again for, for having me here. Thank you to the loft as well. And uh, so let me, let, me, let me try to give you a little bit of of some trends that we are that we are observing, no, and um, I mean as usual, our our view is a little. Our main footprint is Europe and Latin America, so we might have a, a slightly different view to other players, more skewed towards either the North America or Asia, no, that are part of these <coughs> um, big big private banks. But but in any case, we are seeing. We are seeing two or three things, and um, um, I'm going to go directly to things that we have seen even accentuated from uh, from the crisis. No, so uh, first of all is we've seen um, a lot of demand uh, for advice. In, let me put it this way: in complicated times. No, um, so one of the one of the things that I think the crisis has done is that um, it has clearly um, highlighted the value of having uh, professional advice, at least for the higher segments of the private of the private banking world. We are in a context that is completely unique in in a bad way. Uh, so, and my my guys describe it always as the three lows and two highs. And what they say is that we are in an environment of very low interest rates, low inflation low and slowing rates of economic growth 
and then two highs, which is high volatility <laughs> and high levels of net. You know? And that, that gives you kind of a very, very complicated cocktail. And customers have really appreciated during this crisis to have someone on the other side who they can rely on and who gives them at least the, the professional advice and the logic behind the things they can consider. No? So, uh, and, and as a result of that, I mean, customers that were very diversified in, in, and that they were having like a long-term portfolio construction methodology, which is most of what we have, basically what they saw was they saw the markets falling at 40%, 50% in some cases, and suddenly their diversified and professionally managed portfolio was falling 8%, 10%. And for yeah. them, I mean, despite the whole shock, it was a good thing. So, so to me, there, there is one trend which is putting at value the, these advice in complicated, in complicated times, no? with a long-term view and with a systematic and, 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 and professional uh, methodology to, to an approach to investments. No? So this, this has been one, one clear thing. The second thing that we've seen uh, that, uh, that has been um, very, very important during this crisis is the need to be able to work remotely with your, with your private bank. So suddenly here from one day to the other, we had to take all of, all of our customers and work with them remotely. Some of them with a very long distance because for example, we have a big, big bank in Miami um, that manages like $50 billion for the customers. And these customers are mostly Latin Americans. So suddenly these guys were like, uh, I don't know, 5,000 or 8,000 kilometers away. And you needed to work with them remotely. So that has highlighted the importance of digital and the digital tools and the digital processes to be able to open accounts, buy products, etc remotely we didn't we, we were not 100 percent ready in this uh but one thing that the the crisis has done is those things that were fundamental and that required a little bit of effort that we had not done were done very quickly no? so we were able to work in this way and they need to work remotely and they need to to have um as i said i mean my my first trend is you need the human touch but you also need the remote capabilities, the two things together is what, what were very, very powerful. No? And then the third thing uh, that we saw uh, was a democratization, uh, the, the democratization of investment solutions. So all these platforms that were around there um, already, and that were, there were many doubts that they had traction, they didn't have traction. Uh, the best example for, uh, has been to me, uh, there is a platform in Brazil called XP, which is, it's kind of, a, how to put it, it's like an Airbnb of investments. So basically these guys work with independent agents that uh, with a little bit of training and some parameters, they become investment advisors and they work on this platform that is digital, but it also has the, the human touch no, on the other side. But this thing has proven to be very effective in a world where, and this is more for the lower part of the private banking industry, but, but it was very effective for a, a portion of the market that, that really at that point said, okay, I want to continue investment and I need a full digital solution. No? So for the lower part, I think this democratization of the, of the investment solutions uh, has got a little push also from, from this crisis. No? And other than that, I'm somehow relevant for Luxembourg. Luxembourg has been traditionally a hub uh, for people who wanted to take money out of, out of their countries. Uh, and, um, and I think this, I mean, we are getting a lot of questions also for customers in many countries about, uh, about I want to have geographical diversification. What are the best natural hubs for us? No? And uh, I mean, still haven't seen a lot of movement, but we are getting a lot of questions. So I suppose all this brings a little bit more of geographic diversification too. Huh? And mm. this is something that for a hub like Luxembourg should be good as well. But, but um, uh, as I say, this is more of, a, of, a, of something that we are sort of smelling because we are getting a lot of questions. Yeah. Uh, so th th these to me are the, the main trends that we've seen happening over the past months uh, as a result of the, of the crisis. Huh? 
I mean, it's the, you talked about this, the, the work from home and the, the digital interaction. Um, I mean, what I found pleasantly surprising, I don't know how you guys viewed it because you've been very uh, uh, digitally um, astute for quite some time, but how fast banks were able to adapt to the situation. Um, almost contrary to what often are their excuses for digitalization, which is they do have agility to be able to do things relatively quickly. Yep. Um, and a lot of, you know, within a very short time, bank adapted. But the really interesting element about um, the business, which maybe you could give some insight on, is I mean, even just within Europe, and you do have a big footprint here, but then adding in your US uh, American footprint and South American footprint, I mean, there's still a lot of diversity around regulation related to um, digital KYC, electronic signatures, etc. I mean, how are you guys dealing with this? I mean, it must, it must, is it a big mess or is, are you finding a way through? Look, I mean, it is a nightmare, as you are pointing out, because it's different everywhere and uh there's not much logic about the differences. Uh, so we still, whenever we have to send a customer that we have onboarded in one geography, uh, we have to do the full onboarding in the other geography. We have managed to do it by deltas somehow. So what we do is, if you have done the onboarding in Spain and you want to operate in Mexico, we just do the bits, the extra bits that you need due to the, to the regulation in Mexico to make it easier, but still it's a completely different process. This has been actually one of the best things, I mean, there are not many, but one of the good things of, the, of this crisis. It has broken a lot of mental barriers to do these things uh, remotely and digitally. And we have realized that we thought that many of the barriers were technological and they were not. They were just mindset from regulators and even from our own internal lawyers. I mean, in, in some of my geographies, I had got I don't know how many times, hundreds of times from our lawyers that papers needed to be signed physically and shipped uh, through courier or services or whatever. And that a, a, a paper signed on a PDF didn't have the, with a tablet, no, didn't have the validity. Uh, and when this happened, all this suddenly changed and the opinion of the lawyers changed and they said, look, it's an emergency, well, we, I mean, actually, if we look at it carefully, maybe you can work with a PDF sign. And we have started to do things that, that were, were forbidden before, and it's because the need of doing this remotely opened the minds of the, of, of really of, the, of, 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 of our own even compliance uh, officers and, and lawyers. So. Now what we are doing is a lot of work to make sure that those things that we were able to do during this period stay or stay with the little modifications that we need to do because we, we really advanced a lot. Yeah. It was just a change of mindset on of how to look at things. Yeah, that, that's a little worrying. I had um, my uh, meeting recently, a number of the CEOs from the, the banks here and one of them specifically said his biggest concern is that leap forward in so many steps during COVID-19, but his concern is, is that we'll revert to norm afterwards, right? And that these changes won't become permanent in terms of mindset and methodology. Um, let's hope it does. I mean, quite honestly, there's been huge breakthroughs throughout this period. Um, I mean, it needs in terms to happen, of Nasir. I mean, otherwise it would be silly. And, uh, and to be honest, I mean, a paper signed with a pen or a paper signed with a PDF. It's pointless. It's pointless. It's the same. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah, but, but there are still obviously problems in Europe, even with the EIDAS regulation, because there's these, in, in, you know, some archaic nationalized laws, which are barriers to this. I think some countries say that you must keep paper in storage for seven years and things like this, you know, it's, it's insane. Um, the, I mean, we're, we're going through a period, I mean, this is what I find, management industry. We're going through a period uh, right now over the next sort of, it's already begun, but over the next 10, 15 years of the largest wealth transition in history. Trillions of dollars is going to be handed down um, within families um, um, and, and distributed to, to new owners of that wealth who, especially as we all know, uh, in a sort of more digital savvy way, may have 
different needs, different expectations, different drivers for, for managing their money and, and are expecting to do it in different ways. How are, how are you looking at this? Are you, you know, plotting out how your engagement is going to change over time and, and that model of engagement with your customers and uh, as they sort of become sort of the new money, so to speak? Sorry, Nasir, I had like a blip in the connection. Can, can, can you repeat the question, please? Because I, I, I missed kind of the important part. Sorry, I was just saying that uh, there's a huge digital uh, wealth transfer on right now over the next five to 10 years, you know, generational wealth transfer. Oh, okay. And younger generations clearly with their you know, needs, expectations are quite different. How are you looking at, you know, your model of engagement with your customers over the next five, 10 years, et cetera, in order yeah. to ensure you remain competitive? No, the, the way we, I mean, there are a number of trends there that I'm going to, to tell you now about, but the main one is technology. You know, the technology is, the, is probably the biggest change in the behavior of these guys. And so the way we say that we want to approach this is blending, we say we want to blend high tech with high touch. And, um, and uh, the reason is the following. It's very interesting when you talk to, when we talk to our kind of elder customers, let me put it that way, that are very used to just pick up the phone, call their banker, they don't look at the positions in the internet, etc. cetera. Uh, they always tell us, well, you know, when my son or my daughter gets into this, uh, I'm going to have a problem because they do everything on the internet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The truth is when that happens, um, I mean, even, even myself, I have a kind of a generational gap with, with some of these customers. I'm even closer to the, to the next generation no? in age, uh, still uh, a little bit. Uh, yeah, well, but, uh, I, I know you're younger than me, Victor. I still remember that. <laughs> but, but, but what happens in reality is these guys come to us and they obviously, they want instant information in the digital channels. So they want to have full access to their positions, to their profitability, everything with a click. I mean, it's like, you don't want to call anyone for that. You, you, but, but still, when they want to take decisions, mm -hmm. or when they want to talk about the investments and the performance, et cetera, they need, they, they need the banker. And it even surprises their parents how dependable they get also from the, from the, from the bankers. They thought that they were going to do everything digitally and uh, they use it way more, as I say, but they still want that, that, that human touch. No? So uh, still, it's a lot of work for us because we need to have the, the digital tools and the digital means, but, but, but the core of the model doesn't, uh, doesn't quite change in that respect. No? Now, there is a segment that is very different. I mean, if I go down in my wealth management segments and I go more towards the retail towards the retail side, that is very different. There uh, is where clearly there is a trend to digital and we need to make sure that we have the tools. Where, where I, what I always say is that there are two types of tools there. There is the, the, the customer who says, I want to invest myself and they basically need a supermarket there. They need a supermarket of funds, of equities, of all the instruments so they can buy and sell and do whatever they want. That's one segment. Then there is the, the other segment that says, I want you to do mm -hmm. my investments. And for them, uh, what they are normally thinking in their heads is what they call a robot advisor. Uh, but it's not really. M many times it's only an advisor with technology, but in the back there are people. No? So we, anyway, we call it a robot advisor because that's what they have in their minds. But you really need to have that tool. It doesn't to be fully robot, fully artificial intelligence. So you can have people on the back but you need to have a solution that it's automatic for these guys who want you to manage the investment. So from a technological point of view, that is one very big trend that we are seeing in the new generation. And then from a product point of view, there are two things to me that are very important. And one of them, and, and the two of them actually have been um, stressed during the crisis. One is ESG and sustainability and all these things. So among the next generations, you get a huge demand for these kind of products. And it's something you can put more emphasis or less emphasis, but you have to have that flavor among your ice cream. That's, that, that, that's clearly, clearly the case. No? So that's one. And, and there you have more and less extreme views, but, but you need to have it. And then the second one is all this investment related to trends is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, one thing that happened was that, curious, I mean, 
maybe just by coincidence, but all these trends oriented uh, investments, they were all positioned on healthcare, on technology, on sustainability things, on, on robotics. I mean, and, and suddenly what happened was with all these crises, all these trends were the ones that, that were most favored, most favored. So, so these trend-based uh, funds, et cetera, had a very good performance in general with some exceptions during the crisis and they are getting a big, big, big demand at the moment. So that's, that's another part that we are seeing uh, very, very reinforced more at the moment. So I, I would say probably those are the three things that we are seeing more and more linked to the, to the new generations. And I mean, I completely agree with you. This is uh, wealth management and uh, for the foreseeable future has to be a hybrid approach. I always like the, the story that, okay, I might invest 100 euros through a computer, but if I've got 100,000 or a million, I'm not, I need to talk to people about this, right? Um, but how are you then using technology maybe internally to enable your, your customer facing, your relationship managers, your bankers? Because if they're still having to deal, you're looking, I guess, at efficiencies for them, more data, more access to information to, to help them become more efficient and more productive, right? Yeah, so we, we've, we've developed, uh, there are two, two, two big tools, I would say. One is what, we, what our asset managers use internally to, to have a very systematic approach to the investments and, and to do uh, a lot of risk management uh, on, the, on the investments. And, uh, and that's the, we have been implemented, this is Aladdin for BlackRock, uh, from BlackRock, what we are using, and um, we have implemented it all across the operations. <clears throat> and it has helped us a lot to have a way better view of investments, of what's going on, risk management, the same approach in all the geographies, disability across geographies. Uh, so it's been fantastic. It's um, it's a tool that uh, I don't know if anyone from BlackRock is hearing. I won't say it's cheap, but uh, but it's very very powerful. I have to say that they've done a, a fantastic a fantastic job. So that's one big investment technology that we've done. The second one that we we've done internally also is the tool that we use with our bankers. Um, so with all the regulation and with all of this systematic approach that you need to take to have a tool that have all, has all the workflow embedded and that can give them the market research and they can see the portfolios of the customers, do proposals, et cetera, et cetera, has been completely transformational. No? So, and in our case, more than, more than others, because as I said, I mean, for example, our customers in Latin America, they have positions in the States. So the banker is kind of 8,000 8, kilometers away from the customer. So in the past, they had to travel with huge suitcases of papers they would go to the customer, take the paper, say, look at this proposal. They would modify it. They would need to come back to the bank, print it again, take it again in the suitcase, go back to the country. I mean, it was, it was incredibly inefficient. Now they have these tablets. They are connected to our bank. They can review the proposal, modify it on the spot, sign it on the tablet, and get it done. So uh, completely transformational. We have implemented that still maybe in five of our locations, we have five others to go. Uh, but internally, those are the most, um, the, most, uh, the most important tools that we, have, that we have developed. Just jumping back also to the, um, to the sort of new generation of investor and, and, and client, are you seeing um, demand for you know, some of these new asset types that are potentially being enabled like through blockchain you know are you seeing people wanting to access cryptocurrency for example or or you know some of these real real estate um, icos etc is that something you're looking at as well i mean on the on the crypto and all that no i mean not a lot of demand we've seen a lot of talk and, yeah. and they want you to talk about it and they you set up one of these sessions about it you get thousands of connections. It's uh, it's uh, they love the topic. They want to know about it, but they still don't take the, the steps. We haven't seen a big, uh, a big demand. Yeah. I mean, you have some customers that you know they do it and so on, but um, but not 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 a big, not really a big demand. The part that it, it's not exactly what you were asking, but you touched on real estate. Yeah. The part that we've seen a lot of demand and we have done a lot of work over the past years 
And actually, I think it was going to be more shocked with the crisis, and it wasn't. So it, it's, it's keep on building up. Uh, it's alternatives in general. So alternatives related to private equity, to hedge funds, um, to real estate funds. Um, in, in this world of low interest rates, uh, and uh, there is, a, 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 it, it's been incredibly hard to give yield to the portfolios of the customers. So in the end, they still keep their 80% conservative and um, and uh, and then they use I don't know 10 15 20 percent of the portfolio to invest in these things that with a long-term view they should give them some yield you know? so for, uh, there we've done a lot of work and we've seen a lot of demand but not so much on the ones using crypto or any other kind of technology is more of the traditional alternative you know? yeah but I, I mean, obviously, I, I'm not sure if you're still involved in that. Um, you spearheaded the setup of Santander Innoventures when you were in London. Um, your colleague, Mariano, uh, obviously was running that as well. Um, and I know that you've looked at various blockchain investments, et cetera, for, for Santander. Um, are you, as part of your role in wealth management um, and looking at sort of alternative assets, et cetera, sort of keeping tabs or investing, you know, looking at, the potential use for blockchain for basically providing greater liquidity and access to some of these alternative assets. Obviously, you know, there's the real estate uh, thing that's going on. There's uh, people doing um, tokenization of private equity. Um, I've seen tokenization of diamond mines now as well. I mean, do you, uh, is that something you're, you're looking at with any degree of um, sort of urgency? Not so much in our world, uh, to be honest. Uh, I mean, I, I haven't been involved with InnoVentures for some time now, but not, in, not so much in our role. We have used these technologies for other things, for sure. So more in the space of our corporate and investment banking. Uh, we've done a lot of issuance and things like that uh, using, using blockchain. Uh, that's, that's, that's for sure, no? And also we've used it internally in some other things. So for example, in our AGM, uh, we've been already for probably four or five years instrumenting all the voting with a system built also on blockchain, no? So we've been using it for some internal things. We've been using it for, for our corporate and investment banking side. In our investments world, not so much so far, to be honest. Yeah. And where, where do you see or how do you see the whole sector for you developing? Where do you see the new opportunities within wealth management? Well, new opportunities, basically, I would say, um, I think, uh, well, I, 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 as I said, I mean, I think still the need for this advice in complicated times, when you prove that you add value, there there is an opportunity for sure uh in terms of products i would say still alternatives esg as i said and um and uh, and this kind of trends oriented investments are clearly an opportunity and then i think well, i don't know if it's an opportunity of a th or a threat no but the, the all the all, all the technological side it's going to clearly be there um in private banking, as I commented, I think we have cracked it in many ways. Not, not fully, but we have cracked it in many ways. The part that we haven't still fully resolved is the, is the more um, mass market side. No? And, and there we still probably need to find what's the right model and make it scalable across the countries. It's, it's a still very country-based. Mm -hmm. And in some we have these supermarkets, in other we have some more related to our robo advisor. But to be honest, I think we haven't still fully cracked it, no? We haven't still kind of created the platform that can work across countries, et cetera, et cetera, and that, can, and, and that customers can say, okay, right, this is exactly what I, what I want to use to, you, to manage my investments. Uh, and that's why people are kind of testing and trying different solutions and this FinTech and that FinTech, because I think the model hasn't still formed yet, no? So, uh, it would be great to find to find that uh, that kind of key on the keyboard and uh, and push it first. Uh, but I think that's probably the part where we still need to do some work. Okay, so I mean that last one, I guess, is sort of a, ch a challenge and slash opportunity. What what other challenges are you seeing in this area then uh, to to take it to the other side? Yeah, ch challenges. Um, I mean. 
there is probably the biggest the biggest challenge that the industry has is that you really need to be able to prove your value as a manager to the customers and this has become more and more important in in such a low interest rates world no? so with 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 such such low interest rates the conservative products live in the world around around zero yeah and it's very hard to 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 show that you are adding value there to be able to charge anything for that because i mean if if the total return that you can expect yeah is 20 bips, you cannot charge anything, right? So, yeah. so, so the challenge really is how to crack the value added in a, in a conservative world, no? and how to construct portfolios that they, they still keep the conservative profile of the customer, but they give it a little bit more of yield, and then they, they kind of uh, justify or, 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 or prove that you are adding value there. No? To me, that's the key. That's the key. That's that's the key challenge, no? And um, and normally there you have like two worlds, no? You have like the more mass market world, where ETFs and all these things are gaining a lot of space, uh, because the margins are so thin that there's no space for anything else. Yeah. And still on the private kind of higher customers, higher value customers, there is a little bit more of a space, no? But the 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 challenge is really how to how to keep on adding value in such thin markets, uh, so thin margins uh, markets. Hmm? Yeah. Well, on that particular note, I mean, you know, part of your role is covering insurance as well, and um, I think that's a particularly interesting sector within the space of managing a person's wealth and um, and their assets. How are you seeing the insurance side developing within the wealth management space and integrating into it? So, uh, I mean, we've seen uh, some trends, no? And um, I was talking to you about this the other day, but, yeah. but the, the, it's been interesting that from, a, I mean, you have two types of, of insurance. No? Insurance, you have the protection insurance, and there, what we've seen is way more uh, awareness of the need uh, of insurance uh, coming from the crisis uh, in two spaces. One is health in general, uh, health and life. Uh, but not only, the other is unemployment insurance and, and things like that. No? Uh, even I was telling you, no, in, in some places we saw funny behaviors and in the U, in our operation in the UK, suddenly people started to buy travel insurance like crazy, and we had to even stop the sales of travel insurance because they were not going to be able to benefit from it. But somehow, they thought they were going to travel and they needed protection. So there is one thing that I think is actually good, and mainly in some markets like the ones in Latin America, where the awareness for protection. Some countries in Latin America still have 70% of the cars without insurance. So this generated an awareness and it's going to be a trend, I think, that we will see way more people looking for protection to avoid problems like the ones they've had now. No? Also, the industry needs to change some approaches there because many of the policies uh, up to now were excluding pandemics. Mm. And uh, in our case, we didn't have many, but we have, one of the things that we did with all, all of our insurance company was go around and make sure that um, all these exclusions were removed uh, because we didn't want uh, we didn't want any of our customers to be not covered by, by uh, during the pandemic. No? But that's that's one part of the insurance, and we are seeing that trend. So I, I see some kind of tailwinds on on insurance from that point of view. Then there is insurance uh, savings insurance, um, and there I mean. We haven't seen anything specific because that industry is very much driven from the regulations in the different countries. So depending where and how you get the tax benefits, people take more of that or more funds no? and, uh, and, uh, or any other kind of investment. No? So that one, I haven't seen any particular change uh, coming from the crisis. Uh, generally around our geographies, products like unit links, et cetera, et cetera, to, to do to do savings in the long term are very popular, no? but but that was already happening. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, I'm going to ask one last question before we open up to the audience. Uh, audience, yep. please prepare some more questions there. So I'm going to ask you a big sort of visionary question here, uh, Victor. Um, and it relates to health, so it does follow on from COVID. Um, there is a lot of work going on and we are coming closer and closer to a level of cure, maybe, or if you can call it that, or at least advancement in the area of longevity people living significantly longer lives. I mean, clearly already we are living longer lives regardless. Um, the potential impact to wealth management, specifically asset management, pension funds, etc., could be significant. Imagine jumping from a life expectancy of 80 something to 120. Are you guys looking at this in any way, shape or form or thinking yeah, about yeah, yeah. it? No, absolutely. Uh, this could be in the next five to 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, we call it wealth planning or pensions in some of our geographies, and and uh, that's a clear trend. It was coming before the crisis, no? As you said, I mean, yeah. it's linked to longevity, um, and uh, and it's also linked also in in some of the of the countries to the potential crises in the in the in the public systems, no? Yeah. So 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 they need to have. Uh, personally manage the wealth planning solutions and pension plans, etc. It's been it, it's been growing for a while. We are doing a lot of work in there. Normally, uh, again, the industry in many places was not very organized around this, and and they were kind of offering products to the customers. So here is a pension fund, or here is an insurance policy. And also many of the players also were very bad. Uh, they, they would sell you something one day. So you were one day in, I don't know, going to a bank or going to an insurance company or going anywhere. They would sell you one of these plans and you would, you would take it and you would save in it. And then you would get to the point of retirement and you didn't know what to do with it. You didn't know if you had to take the money back or put it in some annuities, etc. So we are working a lot on solutions that that we make sure that go with the first that they don't they don't try to to talk about products basically what we do is we ask the customers questions obviously what's your age what's your income what percentage of your income do you want to retain when uh, then we combine that with the geography or the geographies where they where they work and with that you get the product no but it goes that way it doesn't go the other way around so we are all actually working a lot on technology that makes that process easy because it can get very complicated. But then we also create the system and the monitoring system to make sure that we track the customer through their life on how they are doing with that. And we, and we help them if there's any change in regulation or whatever. But when also when they get to the kind of the accumulation point, the same tool helps them take the decision, avoiding extra cost, et cetera, et cetera, and, uh, and, and puts them in the, in the best decumulation plan possible. No? Yeah. Uh, and, and it's very hard to do because all, I was going to say banks, but not, not only banks, all the companies to create a process in any kind of industry or company that, that can be with the customer for 30 years and take the right steps when in 30 years all the management will have changed, et cetera, et cetera. It's not, it's not easy. No? So we are trying to create something that is very linked to technology. Uh, so the customer is kind of on a, on a flow that lives on its own and we can help them through all this journey. It's something that is growing a lot. There is a big demand for this and, um, and uh, we need to do a lot of work to make it work in the, in the way I said. No? But yeah. it's definitely a trend, not, li not linked specifically to the crisis now. It was coming from before and it's, uh, it's yeah. going to happen anyway. I don't know if you, um, when you were at London Business School, um, Andrew Scott was one of your professors. He was yeah. the, he's, he's, he's completely shifted to focus on longevity. That is now his specialist area. He, he's an advocate of um, all the research of, that's going on. I know some people specifically in this area. I mean, we are potentially in the next 10 years or so see people living jump, jump step to living to 120, which is significant, right? Financial services is going to be disrupted with that probably more than anything else, I think, actually. It's very oh, absolutely. Well, anyway, I'm listen, Victor, thank you. Systems, uh, I know it's a disaster coming somewhere, right? 
Anyway, listen, I thank you very much. It's always enjoyable to talk to you, Victor. It's been too long. I'm going to hand over to Anthony. Anthony will then manage um, the audience asking you some questions. Anthony. Bernard, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for your insights, uh, Victor and Nazir. I'm Bernard Nicolai. I'm a lecturer at uh, Solvay Brussels School, the University of Brussels, and also a private investor. So my question is, what are the areas that you are investigating for partnerships? And in particular, which kind of fintechs attract your interest currently? Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 thank you very much, uh, Bernard, for the question. I, I mean, uh, Nasir knows this, no? since uh, when I was managing you know, ventures in uh, the bank, it was our, the fund that we created to invest in fintechs, actually. Uh, I've been a very, very firm um, believer of the collaboration between the incumbents and the fintechs in the banking world, because I think if you manage to combine this, you get kind of the best of both, both worlds. So you get the dynamism and the, the ability to develop very good things in technology from the fintechs with the customer base that you inherit from the bank. And see, I mean, you make that work, it's wonderful. Problem is, it's quite hard to make it work because the, the, the incumbents get into the fintechs, they fill them with processes and with restrictions that kill those benefits from them, no? And, um, and, and, and the other way around, I mean, the, the fintechs embedded in a bank, well, I mean, both it's very hard to, commit, to combine in any case, but uh, we've done some things there and the ones from my wealth management hat that I'm probably most interested are the ones that can help us crack that thing about the investment platform for the kind of lower part of our, for the more industrialized part of our pyramid. As I said, I don't think anyone has cracked it yet in the, um, in the industry. And probably this combination of fintech and bank can be a solution there. No? So those are the ones that I'm most interested and that normally when I get a lead, I, I go and see them no? to see if I can learn something or I can, we can partner or something like that. No? Well, Victor, could I ask your opinion? What do you think of Goldman Sachs' Marcus platform? Isn't that sort of that area? Well, yeah, but I mean, we've seen many banks uh, trying to go in that direction. And again, I mean, still to be proven, no? Uh, uh, so, I mean, I don't know a lot of the details, but, uh, but everyone is working on this. And uh, yeah. we saw what happened. I mean, I think, I don't know the case very well, but UBS made a big investment in this. Oh, yeah, it just went, yeah. <laughs> so, so a few banks have died, but Goldman Sachs... I mean, your career, the length of your career is not dissimilar to mine. You know, the, the Goldman Sachs were kind of top of the pile 25 years ago. They're still kind of always very smart at what they do. But it was Marcus coming out of nowhere into a segment that Goldman Sachs traditionally had not targeted and seems to have done, been quite successful. I, I, I was wondering what sort of, how the rest of the industry views it, you know. And they are doing that thing also with the partnerships with Apple and all that, no? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. uh, I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense to them, absolutely. I mean, I would be thinking about, probably about the same. Um, let's see where, where they go with that, but uh, it makes absolute sense strategically. I can't, ima I can't yeah. make say that, yeah. So we, we have time for one more question. Naija, are you there? Yeah. Please go ahead. Hello, thanks a lot for this uh, really insightful uh, discussion. So my question is more related, you know, to, as you mentioned, the new investors or the next generation investors, you know, with all the literacy that is available on the internet and things like that, I think that uh, the advice is, um, that um, we can say we are looking for are more, you know, um, demanding in terms of expertise, simulation. I would say that a real added value has to be, um, uh, has to be given in, in the advices. I mean, how, do, how would you deal with this kind of challenge? And uh, what are the I think, that yeah. that? No, I mean, you're touching a very important point. I mean, today, the, and this is happening, I mean, technology is, is provoking this not only in wealth management, it's everywhere. I mean, I used to be a consultant. And when I joined McKinsey, you would go to a, a client, I don't know, a telecoms company, and three very smart guys who came out of business school would turn up there and they would be the guys who would know how to use Excel. 
and they would go there, program a model, do a tree of decision levers. They could simulate the scenarios and everyone at the company was like, wow, these guys are fantastic. And, and then the consultancy could charge thick margins for that. Now what happens? You turn into one of these companies and normally the company has as many MBAs as the consultants. They don't have any differential tool because they, they use the same Excel at the same level or even better at the company, et cetera, et cetera. So everything with technology, with the democratization of technology, everything gets commoditized and, and it's way more difficult to add, to add value. But having said that in our industry, to me, what does make the difference? Uh, it's a combination of things. But first, if you have a very good process in, in, in investment, so if you have a really structured process where you look at the sectors, you decide where to go, where not to go, you have a decision process to decide what to do, what not to do, et cetera, et cetera. In the long term, that delivers. You can make mistakes in the short term, but in the long term, being systematic, having a methodology, not relying on one, pe one person's opinion delivers. So if you have a, a, an investment manager that can do that, you can add value. The second thing that is very important is people. I mean, still, I mean, if I, if I get, if I invest in people who knows about the markets, who can do their research, et cetera, and can process that, and they are really knowledgeable about what they are doing, still that adds value. That adds value. In the same way that in the consultant, in the end, what adds value now is not the smart guy with the Excel sheet, is the guy who has done the same thing in 20 other companies. No, that, that has value. So there is process and, and, and being systematic about it. There is people. And then there is a third one, very important for your, what you were asking about the new generations, which is technology as well, because you need to present that in the way the customer wants to see it. So you might have all of that behind you, but this, this person wants to just sit on a screen and be able to simulate and read the recommendations and the research, the, the, the research. then you need the technology to deliver that. No, so. If you bring the technology, so if you bring the process for investment, the technology and the people, uh, sorry, the technology and the people, yeah. I mean, you can be very smart and read a lot and uh, be very knowledgeable about the markets, but if you leave me alone at my home with my computer trying to understand the world and do my investments, I'm sorry. I mean, I doubt that I can do it better than, than these guys with some scale and all these resources. No, So I think there's still a space to, to deliver the value there and make people uh, do the investment uh, leaning on these on this capabilities. No, the important thing is that you deliver in the way that they want to do it. So probably in the new generations, they don't need to be on the phone with the investment advisor. They just want to read it and do it themselves, fine. But in the back, they need all that infrastructure in, in the same way. Listen, I think we're going to end there. Victor, it's such a pleasure speaking to you. It's been too long. Um, the insights have been fantastic. Really appreciate it very much. Um, real pleasure talking to you. And oh, the pleasure is mine. And uh, thank you for inviting me once again. Congratulations again for the, for the, work, uh, for the work that you are, that you are doing. And, um, and um, I mean, looking forward to, to, to the next, we have the, the occasion. So thank you, Nasir, and thank you, Matthew, for the, for the opportunity. Fantastic, thank you so much. And thank you for everyone who listened in and for the questions. Anthony, I'll, I'll hand over to you to close off.